Good evening again. It's good to see you here tonight. If you have your Bibles, please open with me to the book of Matthew. We're going to finish up the Sermon on the Mount tonight. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 29. Now, I've titled this message, um, The Wake-Up Call. Let's open in prayer and then I'll address that. Father, thank you for this time that we can study your word, that you have kept your word, that you have valued your word, you've kept it pure, that we can trust in it, lean upon it. It tells us the things that are right and the things are wrong and how to get right and how to stay right. It reveals who you are and reveals our own character and our need of you. So tonight, each of us ask that you would just give us a a teachable spirit. That we would hear you speak through your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. This is an interesting passage, and I titled it uh, The Wake-Up Call, and you're going to see why I call it The Wake-Up Call as we move through this passage. And the thing that I would like you to understand, as the world goes on the way it did, is, is before the flood came. This is even a prediction what the world is going to be like. Like the days of Noah, the The world is celebrating now, and yet Jesus is knocking on the door of their hearts. He's knocking on the door of the church, like the church of Laodicea that's unsaved. I've shared before that many pastors believe that as much as 75% of the church is unsaved. In this passage tonight, it kind of confirms that same idea over and over again. And it's, it's a time that each of us need to examine our own hearts. Let's read our text together. It begins in verse 21 of chapter 7 of Matthew. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name cast out demons, in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, acts upon them, will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it was founded upon the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against the house, and it fell. And its collapse was great. And when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who was of authority and not as of the scribes. Now the warning here is about a false profession. And it's probably one of the most important things that Jesus says. Whenever you're reading scripture that Jesus would speak about the end times, Roughly a third of that prophecy speaks about these false teachers, false prophets, people being deceived. People in the church, because these people we're going to see profess their belief, calling him Lord, and yet they did not know him. In fact, they did not practice righteousness, but unrighteousness. I think that would probably be the saddest thing ever when it all comes to the very end and that that judgment, he says, go away, I never knew you. Thinking that you knew him, thinking that you had a, a relationship with him, and there are going to be many that believe they have a relationship, but they have deceived themselves. They've chose to deceive themselves. 
No one can be deceived unless they choose to be deceived. And the way they do that is not wanting to believe the truth, the truth that would set them free. Now, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, a counsel about false profession. He says, these are many ways that most solemn, solemnizing words uttered in this world to open their eyes to the terrible danger of self-deception and self-delusion. People believe the lie because they like darkness more than light. Now, the times that we're in, we're, they're, they're, they're really changing very rapidly. If you watch TV, you watch movies, you see the news, the corruption in this world. You don't need to talk on prophecy. You just look around. You see it being fulfilled before our eyes. Look with me, though, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. It says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, slanders, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness, although they have denied the power to avoid such people as this. When he's talking about that, and he's talking about they have this form of godliness, he's certainly talking about the church. People, whatever congregation that you may be in, there are people that are sitting there week after week, day after day, month after month, year after year, and have never really trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They, they have this form of godliness, but you, they deny the power thereof. There's no change in their life. There's no fruit that is, is lasting. I like what John Butler says. Let me read. This is a strong warning about false profession. And it's not about, again, cultists or and even false teachers in every way, and, and those who deny important doctrines of faith, or about intentional hypocrites who have somehow gained personal gain and profession of faith. But this is just the everyday person who says they're a Christian. The church is deceived. Because the church has not been discipled. People have not put themselves under the word of God. They have not put themselves under another brother and sister and learned from them, learned what the, the word of God said. Now, we were talking two weeks ago. Again, we didn't have a, a message last week because, again, we had a candlelight service and we chose not to show it because of the lighting. But two weeks ago, we looked at this idea of true and false disciples. Let me read just that passage because it fits in. It's a continuing in the context. It says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravishous wolves who will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree that bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so then you will know them by their fruits. And he's speaking of a judgment. So this passage, there are false teachers and false prophets, and people are sitting at their feet. There are churches simply not teaching the Word of God, not teaching people what God said about holiness and purity. Not teaching them about repentance. There's no salvation apart from repentance. That a life, when a person becomes a believer, he's a new creature in Christ, but he has a changed life, a changed attitude. He will not continue in the, in the patterns and the habits of things he did. He will no longer continue thinking the thoughts that he did. 
When he wrongs someone, he will go back to him and say, I, I'm sorry, I never should have acted that way. No Christian would act that way. Please forgive me. Things that we had never, ever thought about before. There's a change. But these people within church are, are bitter and angered. Day after day, week after week, month after month, and they never forgive anyone. And they carry this bitter root upon them. See, Jesus now comes to the end of this Sermon on the Mount. He, he's taught the principles how you and I to, to live in the kingdom of God as God's children, as children of the kingdom. And he's warning the hearers because in every crowd, again, there are those that, that are hearing superficially, but they're really not listening. Sometimes they even yell, amen, brother, amen, and point the finger at others. And they're hypocritical. And Jesus is warned against this idea of salvation, what they call, again, and I'll talk about it a little later, cheap grace. Just come to the altar and say a sinner's prayer and everything will be fine. Come to Jesus and everything will be fine. I don't believe that's true because the moment you come to Jesus, boy, there is a new, <laughs> things change. There's a battle going on for your soul, for your mind, for your body. But Jesus will never leave you, never forsake you, will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. And you choose a different walk. And even tonight, I'm going to encourage you, choose today whom you will serve. Will you serve the true and living God, or will you serve yourself, your flesh? We talked earlier about, again, the, the way is straight and narrow that leads to life, but broad and wide that leads to destruction. See, all these things tie together. Jesus is warning the people. And some will say, well, this is a hell and brimstone. Jesus is speaking the truth because he loves the people so much. He wants them to know the truth that will set them free. And each person has to make that decision. Not to make the decision is making the decision for that road that's broad and wide that leads to destruction. So he, he warns against this idea that salvation can come to a man in, in a normal course of things, that you can, you can just live a good life. You can just do a, enough good works. You can just follow a, a, a false teacher, even though you know he's false, but you can just continue. You can believe anything that you want to believe. But that's not what the Bible teaches Jesus turns to the, the danger that lies in the heart of every individual himself. It's that bent towards sin in each one of us. That thing that causes us to, to sin, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the self-delusion, deception. Well, that's true about others, but that's not about me. Because I'm a good person. There's no one good, not one. All have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. But what he's going to talk about is this, this need for salvation that rests and trust in Jesus Christ. No sinner's prayer will ever save a person. No oral confession that Jesus is Lord. It, it can't save you unless you have a true and repentant heart. There is no salvation apart from repentance. That means there's a, a change in a lifestyle, a change about who God is. That he requires perfection to go to heaven. And, and it's that imputed righteousness of Christ. It's only through his work of the cross, his atonement that he did for you and me. And we receive it by faith. In John 6 Verse 29 says this, And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. 
The only work that you're really required to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And if you truly believe in him, then your life will change. There will be good works. There will be fruit in your life. You're not doing it for for salvation, but it comes natural. Because the, the Spirit of God comes in you when you're born again, and he gives you new desires in your heart. His Spirit testifies with your spirit that you're saved and you're going to heaven. It's written in 1 John that you might know you have eternal life and that eternal life is in his son, Jesus Christ, knowing him. But there's this profession that I know him and Jesus says, go away, I never knew you. And these are some of the saddest words in the Bible that someone can think they have a relationship and they don't. Dietrich Bonhoeffer knew the reality of this kind of self-delusion in, in the Lutheran church in Germany in his day. He called it cheap grace. It was a term for describing it. Here was a church, in, in like many denominations in America, in which the profession of faith was, was present, in which good works were done, but in which most of the people had simply never been born again. They were taught about grace, but but it was a, a grace without conversion. And Proverbs 30, verse 12 says this, there's a kind who is pure in their own eyes, yet is not washed from his filthiness. Dietrich Bonhoeffer goes on in his cost of discipleship. He writes, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Well, let me share from another one from the past. A.W. Pink declared, never were there so many millions of nominal Christians on earth as there are today. Never was there such a small percentage of real ones. We seriously doubt whether there will ever be a time in history of the Christian ear when there was such a multitude of deceived souls within the churches who were very, verily believe that all is well in their souls. In fact, the wrath of God abides upon them. He then added, and we know that no single thing better calculated to undeceive them than the full faithful exposition of the closing verses of the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. These are just two people, one from the 1800s, one from the 1900s, but there are a multitude of, of preachers through have seen it in every generation. In fact, what they believe today, it's increasing even more. The profession of faith but not the possession of salvation. Not the possession of a a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I need to ask you tonight, does this describe you? What is your relationship like with Jesus Christ? Are you the one who's maybe even correct in in the doctrine, but never have come to know the Lord personally? And and see, this is what God requires as a personal relationship relationship to personally rest and trust in him and lean not on your own understanding knowing that he sustains you and he keeps you he promises if if you seek first the kingdom of God his righteousness and he will add all things seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness he'll take care of everything it means you trust and rest in him. Well, look with me in verse 21 of our text. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus here is is called Lord for the first time. It it was actually quoted from Isaiah 3.3. You find it also in Matthew 3.3.4. This is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready for the way of the Lord. Make his path straight, pointing to the fact that the Lord was going to come, the Messiah, the anointed one. But here, Jesus, 
declares that he's Lord. He'll take the worship at, at this point. See, Jesus continued to deal with the matter of these false prophets who claimed a, a special relationship with him. They expected that their great works entitled them to be accepted into the kingdom. They boast on what they did, but they were only false prophets. They were false teachers. Their disciples followed them in the same way. They professed the relationship with Christ for their own personal gain. Through the years, there have been many that I know that come to church. They come to church to, to meet people for business. They come for many reasons. Rarely do they come just to meet with the Lord, to hear his voice, to hear a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, to be prayed for or to pray for others, to exalt his name, to sit at his, his feet. There's something interesting in verse 21, too. And he goes on, but, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. See, these false teachers, false prophets, these people who simply were not really believers at all, they lack that submission to really the Father's will. The Father's will is you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you be saved. And that you walk in his ways. That's how you fulfill God's will. To love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength, and love your neighbor yourself. And that means a sacrificial love of giving of your, yourself, your time, sometimes your finances. It's steaming others higher than yourself. And, and that's something that we don't see in the body of Christ, where people are really steaming others higher than themselves. It's all about us because as I read in Timothy, that's what it says the end times is like. I'm so thankful that I don't know who's saved and who's not saved. And every pastor I know says the same thing. We're thankful that we can bring the word of God, but the people have to choose. Will they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? The will of the Father is expressed continually through the teaching of Jesus. Matthew 12, 50 says this, For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother, my sister, and my mother. The one, again, who's doing the Father's will is a part of the family, is, is in relationship with them. The intimacy, the closeness. Well, in verse 22, we see the deceived. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name, perform many miracles? What he's doing is describing the deceived. He says, many will say, not a few, many. And I want to add to that in really what it means in its context when you read all the other passages together. A large number of a huge number. So many are going to hell and they don't even know it. And yet they're professing this name. And we call ourselves a Christian nation and yet look at the, the morals of this country. How can we call ourselves Christians? And we do not do the Father's will. Now he uses a phrase there, did you notice that on that day? It's a carryover from the, the Old Testament. It's important to understand. It refers to what we call the day of the Lord. It's a, it's a day of judgment. The day of the Lord is not an individual day. It can be part of that an individual day, but it is a period of time when God deals with Israel. He's going to wake up Israel as a nation. The church is taken away at that point already. He's going to be purifying again pulling out the true remnant out of Israel and shaking up the heathen. They're still in this world, giving them their last opportunity. Those who have never heard who Jesus Christ is. And that's hard to believe that we have a world that has not heard who Jesus Christ is. 
But there's much of the world has not heard. Now again, what God is going to do is he's going to rescue the faithful, those who have trusted in him, believed in him, have a relationship with, but he's also going to judge the oppressors, those who have not kept the Father's will, who have not really believed. They've, they've lived a hypocritical lifestyle. They've trusted in their works. And no works can save you or me other than the work that Jesus did on the cross. There's atoning death for you and me and that it was raised from the grave on that third day, showing that it was accepted by the Father. He paid the price that we could not pay. Now, many would say that Jesus' words come on too strong, too harsh. Sometimes I've said, you know, you, you need to believe in the, the Jesus of the, the Bible. What do you mean the Jesus of the Bible? And people want to argue and fight because there are many Jesuses in the world, many, many Christ in this world, false Christ. Unless a person trusts in this one who died for you and me, have a relationship with him. They will never enter the kingdom of God. This is why the warning is so strong. He, he's shown us what life looks like. Just beginning with the Beatitudes, we, we saw that those things lead a person to salvation. The, what happens? One thing dovetails into another. In fact, when we look at Jesus' words, it, it, it seems so very judgmental. But in reality, most people don't really Understand the facts. There's always warning before wrath. Always warning before wrath. A person will choose life or they'll choose death. Many are naive, thinking and trusting that they have a relationship because they want to believe it. Matthew 10, 15 says this, Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that city. You and I have, in this generation, have such a great knowledge of the Bible. The Bible is in so many translations, so many tools to understand it, the original meaning of the text. And yet at the same time, the Bible is so simple. It's so simple a child could understand it and come to that saving knowledge of Jesus. They may not understand all the different things, but they can understand who Jesus Christ is and what he did for them. What we're seeing are, are really words of deceit by the people. They're deceiving themselves. They bought into the, the lie. The Jew would use a term, again, uh, Lord, simply to show respect for a title, a position, a, a one of honor, one who is a, a political leader or a military leader or a religious leader, or even including a, a teacher. They would we'd call them Lord, Master. But, but for those people, notice what they say, Lord, Lord. This is suggesting much more than just, you know, a, a human respect following comments make it clear they knew look again at verse 22 it says many will say to me you know he's he's declaring he's lord by saying this on that day lord lord did we not prophesy in your name notice he says lord lord did we not prophesy in your name acknowledging who he is many will know They'll know with their mind, but they've never come to that personal relationship. Sometimes they move from church to church, seeking after signs and wonders, a, a prophetic word, a new prophetic word. The Bible itself is prophetic. It's God breathed out the very word of God. It's words of life. It will direct you and guide you. God has chosen to reveal himself through the word. 
and reveal his own character and nature to you and me. See, Jesus refused to accept. They're addressing him as Lord. It's perfectly clear. He renounced them as even followers. Oh, they were going through the moves. They had the confidence that they, they thought they had this relationship, but yet they really didn't know. The reality is they were only professors, and they never possessed that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen back in Psalms chapter 6, verse 8. Leave me, all you who practice injustice, for the Lord has heard the sound of, of my weeping. In Matthew 25, 41, he says this, and, and then he will also say to them on his left, depart from me who are cursed people into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. And then in Matthew 24, verses 11 and 12, and many false prophets will rise up, mislead many people, because of lawlessness is increased, and most people's love will become cold. I don't want to be during the tribulation, not because of what's going to go on, just the people, the hardness, the coldness of their heart, their selfishness. See, in Matthew 24, it, it's talking about, again, these false teachers, warning and warning and warning and warning. And when you talk to people, they don't want to believe. But what does the Bible say? And people don't know what the very Word of God is. Well, the works really tell the truth about them. See, it's, it, it's, it's not uncommon that someone um, other than God's people can do mighty works. Since works can be faked. So if works can be faked, then works alone are not adequate to reveal the truth whether they're saved or not. But see, they had this confident claim. They, they prophesied in his name, exercised demons in his name. They did miracles in the, in the name of Jesus. Jesus never says, no, you didn't do these things. But he says there's no fruit. He says this is wickedness. This is evil. These things are demonic. These are not of him. These are not done by the, the Spirit of God. Confident in what they're doing. Confident that they're, they're doing it in his name, but they were not doing it in his name. The problem was that, that there was fruit, but the fruit was counterfeit. Satan is the father of lies right from the very beginning. He, he counterfeits everything that is good. Their claim was true, but their fruit was counterfeit in every way. It didn't last. It was demonic. Even perhaps human contrivance, you know, they, they did it and manipulated situations to call tension, and we talked a little bit about that on, on Sunday, how people have, have kind of fake gold dust coming down in church services. We've known that people have faked miracles. And the devil, more powerful than you and me, will do many false signs and wonders. So it shouldn't surprise us that Satan counterfeits everything that is good and perfect, everything that is God. Well, listen to Zechariah, though, 4, 6. And then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord by Zerubbabel, saying, not by might or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of armies. The only thing that is good and pure is what is done in the spirit of God. When a person becomes a believer, the spirit of God works through them. It's pure. Our hands aren't on it. Glory is given to God. Again, Matthew 24, 24 says this, for False Christ, false prophets will rise and provide great signs and wonders 
so as to mislead, if possible, even the left. So we, we know they're rising. We know that we see them even in this country. I've been there when people are, are doing what they call false miracles, and if you're standing clear and, and just observing, you know it's not true. God gives discernment to his people if they really want to know the truth. He will reveal to them. You pray and you ask him. In 2 Thessalonians 2.9, it says this, that is, the one who is coming in the court of activity, Satan, with all power, and notice false signs and wonders. And yet there are many today chasing after false signs and wonders because the word of God is not enough. They want to harness this power themselves. Now listen from the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verses 13 through 15, and he performs great signs so that, that he even makes fire come down out of the sky so to the earth in the presence of the people. He deceives those who live on the earth because the signs in which he's given him to perform in the presence of the beast telling those who live upon the earth to make the image of the beast who had a wound in the sword and has come to life and is given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause those who do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. It's not stopping here. It's only escalating. As we get closer to Christ's coming, the demonic activity will increase like never before that you and I have ever known. And yet many are chasing after it. Listen as I read 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith as so as to move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. You know, the mark of a believer is love. If there's something that you catch tonight besides those false teachers is this love. That when you and I leave this place, that, that the words we speak are always love, tender. Love will tell the truth. Love will care, be concerned. Paul says that the, the person who prophesies and performs these great miracles but has no love is absolutely nothing. I've seen people that are chasing after signs and wonders and, and they have this selfishness about them. They walk all over everybody as if they were trying to be promoted in a business. They're like a a person who is in Vegas has got the days in their eyes and just keeps gambling and doesn't even know what they're doing. The false prophets, their followers, claim to have done these things in Jesus' name. They, they claim his authority behind these deeds, but it's not. It's demonic, magical incantations claiming again to, to be of God, but Jesus sees right through it. As we move closer to his coming, you're going to see more of these false signs and wonders. I'd like to share a true illustration. This is one of my favorite South African Africans is a pastor named Trevor Hudson who serves a church in Benona near Johannesburg. Trevor is, in some ways, the South African Dallas Willard evangelist, a loving, caring person, or Richard Foster, focusing as, as he does on the inner work of the spirit and the, the spiritual formation from inside. Trevor's ministry is to the homeless, the suffering in South Africa. It's well known. He describes the story of someone who makes what Jesus wants us to be ordinary acts of love. Not just glorious giftedness that comes from life. No. 
Well, it's a story of a West Indian woman in London who had just been told that her husband had been tragically killed in a street accident, and the woman suffered for days. She sank into the corner of the sofa. She sat there rigid and unhearing. For a long time, her, her terrible trance-like look embarrassed her family and friends and officials who came and went. And then a school teacher of one of her children, an English woman, called and seen how things were, went and sat down beside her. The teacher put her arm around the tight of the shoulders of the grieving woman. And then a white cheek touched the brown. Then as the unrelenting pain seeped through her, the newcomer's tears began to flow quietly, falling on the two hands linked of the, the women in their lap. For a long time, that was all that was happening. And then at last, the West Indian woman began to sob Still not a word was spoken. After a while, a visitor got up and left, leaving momentarily a contribution to help that family meet the immediate practical needs. Trevor heard the story from John Taylor, who went with the insight to observe how such experience needs to be interpreted. This is the embrace of God, his kiss on life, that is, the embrace of, of his mission, of our intercession. That is what Jesus wants from us. Not our gifts, but our life. But what brings us to honor, what serves our neighbor. At the judgment, Jesus will not ask about our gifts. He'll ask about our cheeks. Have they touched the cheeks of those who suffered? And the hands and held the hands of those who endure pain. If our gifts are directed at those of the most in need. But people are confident in what they're doing. The real thing that the greatest need right now is love and unity. That unity in Jesus that brings us to love one another and just care. Because God is love. If you've been born again, you will love people. And you'll be led by love to do the things that please the Father. Love will lead you in the will of God, away from the showmanship, away from selfishness and self-centeredness and arrogance. Look with me again in verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Again, by referring to himself as Lord and depicting himself as the, the ultimate judge. Jesus will judge humanity. Jesus implied, yes, he's deity. He's speaking about the judgment for the believer, the bema seat rewarded for the things that you have done, that God has given you that ability, that opportunity to love someone, to help someone understand what it means to be a believer. The love for someone who's lost a loved one, just to sit there with them and care. See, there's two judgments. One is the bema seat for those that have truly been born again. That's where God will reward you for the opportunities he gives you. But there's a white throne judgment for all those who call upon his name, profess his name, but don't even know him. That's in Revelation 20. There's a judgment and has been delegated to Jesus. And Jesus knows the heart. Well, look with me in verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me who practice lawlessness. Jesus is simply speaking words of judgment, and, and people say, well, that's not a comfortable message. The Bible, sometimes it, it comforts and exhorts and encourages, and, and sometimes it really challenges us and cuts to our heart, and, and I'm thankful it does because I wouldn't be here. 
if I didn't know what the Word of God says and that God is holy and he must judge sin. But he's brought the good news to us. It's in verse 23 again. It uses that word uh, new, or some translations use the word no. It's commonly used, again, in, in literature, recognition of denoting a, a relationship, even in, in having a sexual relationship between a husband and a, and a wife. But here it, it speaks of a, a unique relationship that God has with his people. He wants to have a relationship. He wants to be the one that, that when someone loses a loved one, that he's sitting there with you, holding you up, caring for you. He knows what you're going through, and he does that through you and me. We're his vessels that he wants to use. See, we often think that God wants it this way and that way, and, and this will please him, and what really pleases him is when we do the Father's will, and that is simply to love him and love those that God brings in our life. Amos 3.2 says, You only have I known among you all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all your wrongdoing. See, unless we choose life and choose a life of love, then we will be under this judgment. Love is that mark of a, one that is truly a believer. Love is something that he pours into the heart of a believer. You'll stop it up. You'll, you'll, you'll quench that love. And ultimately, if you continue that way, you reveal you're really not a believer at all. You've deceived yourself. In the end, God will expose the hearts of every person on that day of judgment. I don't know how he's going to do it. I, I've often thought about there's going to be a big screen because we have screens behind us that we use it, and all of our life will flash before us, and we know we're busted. I used to think that everyone else will know I'm busted, but everyone else is going to be on that big screen, a stripping away, showing that we're without excuse. For the one, though, that believes in him, trusts in him, rests in him, born again, will understand that that love has been poured into the heart of the person. His righteousness has been imputed to us. There's three things that we find about a, a true disciple of Jesus. One, they truly affirm his lordship. He truly is the Lord of their lives, not lip service. They check in. They want to know, what are we doing today? When they blow it, they go to him. They confess their sin. And the second thing is they submit to, again, his authority. They don't argue with him. They don't fight with him. Oh, they may begin that way, but less and less because they know he's love and he wants the best for them. They learn to obey his commands. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands, the very evidence. See, Jesus insisted that a person is confirmed a, a true disciple, not by prophecy or exorcism, the working of miracles, even the speaking of tongues. Some teach that unless you speak in tongues, you're not saved, and, and yet you can go in the deepest jungles and there'll be those that speak tongues that have been not born again, or the Mormons speak tongues. The real mark is a love for God. Lordship. Submitting to his authority. Obeying him. Jesus' words simply were, I never knew you. Showing they were truly not his disciples. Reading this passage, it just grieved my heart to think that that there will be those that stand before, and when they hear those words, how their hearts must be torn. And we have that responsibility to explain and, and teach them. And he says in verse 23, I never knew you. Leave me who practice lawlessness. And yet Jesus in Revelation 3, 20 through 22 is, is, is seen there is knocking on the door. Let me read it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, 
I will come in to him. I will dine with him and he with me. The one who overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. And the one who has an ear, let him hear. Hear what the Spirit says. The church, Jesus is standing on the outside of the church. This is the end days church. Not only is he standing on the outside of many churches, he's standing outside a person's heart, knocking, calling to him. There's a warning before wrath. He, he, he's pleading with them. Come, all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest for your souls. He's calling, he's calling. Yes, there's this warning of wrath. There's a judgment coming. But the call is going out. The Spirit's grieving. Jesus is knocking. 1 John Chapter 3, verse 4 says this, everyone who practices sin practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. The idea of practice means a habitual lifestyle, an unchanged lifestyle. If a person continues in that same lifestyle, they're not a believer. A believer recognizes these things, confesses these sins, he repents of them, and he no longer walks in these as a habitual thing. And then in Matthew 13, verse 41, the Son of Man will send the angels and they will gather from all the kingdoms all the stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. So some of these people, they're a stumbling block. They're leading people astray, but they're not leading them astray unless they want to go astray. The temptation is much for them. When we finish with verses 24 through 29, and he begins with the wise and foolish builder. We've all heard this story. The adjectives of the wise and foolish describe the, the man again, his spiritual, the, the person's spiritual and moral state. Not his intellect. Not how much he knows. Not how much can he quote. Not what he can claim he can do. Whether one is considered wise or foolish is determined by his response really to Jesus' teaching. That's what it says. Look with me in verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, acts upon them, will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against the house, yet it did not fall, for it was founded upon the rock. The rock that we see again and again is the Lord Jesus Christ through the Scripture that our lives need to be founded upon him. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, the call has gone out. The words are here. Previously, it said in Revelation, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. People can close their hearing, choose not to hear because they want to believe a lie. It's here that Jesus effectively sums up the whole theme of, again, the Sermon on the Mount from, again, from verse 17 in chapter 5 right up to here. He does it with this parable. And Jesus calls the audience to decide between himself and notice what we've been talking about, this religious establishment, these false teachers, these false prophets. And that's the same place you and I are. We, we make a decision to be in Christ, and some make a decision to be in the church. Those that are in Christ are the church, but some hang on to a, a religious organization. The church, they congregate together, yes, and they worship together, and they study together. It's an organism, as we talked about on Sunday morning. So important. Jesus draws a strong dividing between himself and others in this foundation of life. He, 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 in a sense, is giving us this picture and reminding us what we'll see in John later, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way to the Father but through him. Acts 4.12 says this, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven has been given for mankind to be saved in those who believe in him will prove themselves 
not by just being a hearer of the word, but a, a doer of the word. Following and trusting in him. First John. 5 verses 11 through 13. And, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. And the one who has the son has life. And the one who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you know that you have eternal life. And I love that. God wants you to know tonight that you have eternal life. And that life is in his son. And when a person has that life, he hears the voice of God. He acts upon the voice of God. He hears them speak. When they're reading the word, they know that he's speaking to their hearts and they want to obey him. Now it's interesting that during the hot summers, and boy are they hot and again in Israel. And you come down to the the Sea of Galilee, the sand around the Sea of Galilee, it, it becomes hard, hard, almost like concrete in a way. And it's, it's interesting. And the wise builder would have to break through that, dig down until they, they found a, a foundation to build upon of the rock. Sometimes a builder in Israel had to go down as much as 30 feet to find a, a solid rock foundation that they could build upon. And this is hard work. And it's hard for a Christian because it requires that you and I get in the Word. It requires that we spend time with Him in prayer. It, it, it requires that we walk that straight and narrow path that leads to life and the temptation is going to bombard us from every direction. Years ago, Sears Tower in Chicago and when it was ready to, to build it, they had to go down a thousand feet before the builders found a rock upon which they can construct the tallest building in the world at that time. And this is something that you and I will continually to build upon the rock, our foundation, Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what storms come our way, it doesn't matter. How rough, if your house is built upon the rock, your foundation is upon Jesus Christ. The storms symbolize Satan bombarding and attacking, attacking the believer's faith. But if you're grounded upon the rock, you're safe. Now, he contrasts that in verse 26 to the, the foolish builder who, who hears but doesn't, he doesn't do. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against the house, and it fell, and, and the collapse was great. And what they did is they built it upon the sand. The sand becomes a picture of this religious establishment. The false teaching, the false prophets. Remember, that's the context of this whole passage he's been talking about. The man who builds upon sandy soil symbolizes those who do not give Jesus and the word its proper place in our lives. They discredit Jesus. They discredit the word and they will suffer the consequences. And the emphasis is on great destruction that will come. A great judgment will come upon them. These are the people that, that take that road that's broad and wide that leads to life. It's destruction is where it brings. It's a choice that a person has to make. So Jesus ends his sermon by making it clear that these two truths are taught. We've seen them consistent. We'll see them again as we go through the scripture. Unless a life has changed, no salvation has ever occurred. There's, there's going to be a judgment, and, and the choice is yours today. And each day, when verse 28, we, we see their amazement when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his words. And, and it was the way he spoke. They were astonished at his, his teaching. He spoke with authority, not as the scribes. The scribes, and, and again, the, the Pharisees, they're always quoting someone else. And not that it's wrong. 
Jesus simply explained the text. He was the Word of God. The Word became flesh, and he spoke the very words of life. So in verse 29, it says he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as the scribes. He was teaching them with certainty. And I don't know how much you know or you don't know, but whatever you know, if you believe this is the word of God and you speak it with assurance, you are speaking authority. When you know this word is true, people will know that you are speaking with authority. They know that it's work in your life. The world has a problem with absolutes. But God's word is absolutely true. Now the aim on this sermon is doing. And by the way, this sermon here, if you would read it, might take about seven to ten minutes. Chapter five through seven. They didn't follow him for days, for hours. Listen to him seven minutes and go away. This is only a snapshot of what he said. It summarizes the main points. The Holy Spirit is led to give us the most important parts that we would understand what is really important. These words that Jesus set before us, they're really two choices as we saw. Wise and foolish. They both share the same traits. Each were builders. Each heard Jesus' instructions. One listened and one obeyed. One listened and one didn't. See, disciples who build their lives on the bedrock of Jesus Christ and his message of the kingdom of heaven are truly wise. They will not be shifting in the culture the religious fashions, because they're grounded upon the rock. The rock is Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the challenging words. Lord, I pray that each of us here will really examine our own hearts, our own motives. That we examine whether we're really saved or we just professors, or do we possess this relationship? Do we find ourselves running into the arms of you, Jesus, and finding the comfort in the world? Lord, there's no other place to turn but to you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your patience with us. And thank you that you have given us the wisdom to understand, the will to obey. And all we need to do is call upon your name and you will lead us in all truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.